Happy Mother's Day, Mom, and to all the ladies at PCKS. I'm in the little I miss you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you. I love you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you. Thank you for everything. Happy Mother's Day to my mom and all the amazing moms out there watching us right now. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. Happy Mother's Day, Grandma. I love you. Happy Mother's Day, Aunt Jess. I love you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Emma. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers at PCKS. Young and old, I hope you have a wonderful Sunday. Mama. Happy Mother's Day, Mom, and to all the women at PCKS. A picture. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. And to all the women at PCKS. Yes, Happy Mother's Day. Thanks to everyone who sent in a video as part of those opening greetings. As was mentioned there, Mother's Day at PCKS isn't just a day when we celebrate mothers, but when we give thanks for all the women in our church family, for who God has made you to be, for your gifts and your graces, and for all that you add to the life of our congregation. So a happy Mother's Day to all of you. And of course, welcome to everybody who's watching this Church at Home service. Whether you're part of our church family, or perhaps a friend, a relative, a neighbor, or perhaps today you've just stopped by on your own volition, uh, stopped by our service for the first time. You're, you're most welcome today. While we continue to look forward to when we can physically be together again, our prayer is that for all of us, that we'll be strengthened and encouraged by what we share in our time together today. Each Sunday, we're reminded that the most important welcome in our gatherings comes not from me or from any other member of PCKS, but from the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, he's the one who opens wide his arms in welcome to all who this morning are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who might feel worthless and wonder this morning if God cares, to all who fail and need strength, to all who sin and need a saviour. Great news is that he's more than qualified to welcome every one of us this morning because he has revealed himself to be the ally of his enemies, the defender of the guilty, the justifier of the inexcusable, and the friend of sinners. To all of us, Jesus this morning says welcome. If you are visiting with us today here for the first time, uh, we'd love to meet you afterwards. Uh, you're invited to join us in a Zoom chat room, maybe just to say hello or to ask a question about something in the service or about our church. Uh, we'd love to see you there. You'll find the, the details of that chat room in the description box underneath the YouTube video. But now I invite all of us to join together in the call to worship uh, you'll find that on the screen or in the downloaded bulletin if you did so from our website. The call to worship today comes from Psalm 145. I'll do the leader part and I invite you to respond with the people part. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. There is no end to his greatness. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your power. All your works praise you, Lord, and your faithful servants bless you. They make known the glory of your kingdom and speak of your power. My, my mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. We join together in our opening song, again led by 
our socially distancing garage band, we sing together, Men of Faith. this time, I invite you to join with me in the prayer of adoration, after which we'll recite the prayer of confession together. The words will be on your screen. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks this morning. We give you thanks as your people for you allowing us to gather together in these difficult times, albeit remotely, that we're still together in spirit, worshiping the one true and living God. Lord, we praise you because there is none like you. Lord, your power, your might, your wisdom, mercy, strength, your goodness and love, Lord, there's none who compare to you. You alone are God. You alone are worthy of praise. God, and we give you thanks this morning for calling us as your people, for the chance that we have to come and to worship you. For Lord, we know that there was a time where we were far off, far away from you, that sin had created a chasm far too wide for us to, to overcome. And yet at the right time, at the right moment, you, Lord, you sent your one and only son, the Lord Jesus, to come and to die for sinners like us. Lord Jesus, it's because of your body and your blood broken and shed for us that we, we are redeemed. We are no longer the outcasts. We are no longer the objects of wrath that we once were, but we are now adopted and beloved children of God because of you. You have sealed us with your spirit, claimed us as your own, and have promised us that we will one day have a place with you in your heavenly kingdom. This is unimaginable grace unfathomable love that you have shown to us. Thank you, Lord. 
you know, we lament because this week we've not lived as your children, we've not lived as your people, as those whom you have called to yourself. We've wandered and we've strayed and we've tried to make our own way in this world. In light of the times that we live in, we've tried to be our own God, our own savior. We've tried to calm our fears, pacify our anxiety, relieve our boredom. And we've looked to ourselves and to the idols in our life to satisfy these needs, and we have not looked to you. So Lord, we come to you this morning, and we ask for forgiveness, knowing that you are the God who is free to forgive. We ask you to continue to do a work in our hearts, to turn us away from ourselves and away from our idols, and turn us to you, the one who gives life and life in the full. So God, we confess our sins together this morning as your people, using these words. Father, we're sorry for the many times that we've left you and chosen to satisfy our own selfish desires, for the times we've hurt the members of our families through thought, word, or deed, for the times we were unkind and impatient with those who needed our time and concern, for the times we were too weak to stand up for what was right and allowed others to suffer because of our cowardice, for the times we refused to forgive others Father, we have sinned. Forgive us in the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. This morning's words of encouragement come from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, beginning in verse 25. Jesus himself says this, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me, they shall never die. We invite you to pick up your cell phone or even use the YouTube chat, if you wish, to pass the peace of Christ digitally to one another this morning. During this Easter tide, the season of weeks uh, following on from Easter, we've been affirming our faith uh, using words from 1 Peter chapter 1, recognizing the centrality of Jesus' resurrection to our faith. So we're going to continue to do that today. You'll find the words on the screen again in your bulletin. Christian, what do you believe? We believe in God the Father, by whose great mercy we have been born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We believe in God the Son, who died for our sin and rose again for our justification. And we believe in God the Holy Spirit, who bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we're here, uh, two familiar faces for all of you who've been watching our services, but uh, I wanted to uh, spend a few minutes with Jeremy just to interview him because as most of you know, yesterday was his official graduation date from Cairn University with his MDiv. And uh, while he wasn't able to uh, walk through that ceremony because it's been canceled or postponed, uh, we wanted to mark it in some way. So first of all, Jeremy, on behalf of the congregation, congratulations. Well done. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to ask a, a few questions. Um, so as many people know, you and I started at PCKS on the very same Sunday back in 2008. And uh, I was wondering, uh, 
back then, what what would you have seen your vocational path uh, to be at that point? And um, would would the Jeremy Peterson of two thousand eight been surprised that seminary lay in the future? I think this is a it's an interesting question because it seems like a lifetime ago. I guess vocationally, what I what I had in my mind was was something in in the business field. I mean. I was still I was still uh, pursuing my undergraduate degree, and um, you know not not too long after that I um, I was in a like a retail sales position for a long time and kind of worked my way up the ranks. So I thought that there was probably a future there somewhere, um, but uh, yeah, I guess I guess I would I would say I, I I thought I would be in in the business world somewhere, and then. Um, to answer the second part of that question, uh, I would have I would have never thought that uh, seminary was in my future, but um, I was wrong. Do you remember roughly what year it was when you started to think about that as a possibility? Uh, I I don't. Uh, to be to be perfectly honest, like time over the last <laughs> four or five years has been just like a blur. A blur, yeah. But um. I don't know. So, so I left my position um, in sales. I can't remember what year, but started working at the garage um, as the boys program coordinator and over in West Grove. And um, that was, I guess, kind of a, uh, an on ramp into into ministry of sorts. I think that really kind of um, gave me a taste of what vocational ministry might be like. And I, I have a huge heart for, for teens. So um, I think I started thinking about it seriously while I was at the garage. But I, I think if I'm honest, even, even when I committed, because I remember having a conversation with you, Andrew, and I was, I was hesitant to go to seminary because I didn't exactly see the value um, that, it would, that it had. So even I think once I've committed to, to go to Karen, um, I don't, I don't think I was still a hundred percent sold that vocational ministry was in my future. Um, but I think, I think any doubts that I had going into seminary were quickly, uh, flushed away after, after a semester or two. I was, I was pretty, uh, pretty confident once I started school that, um, that what I wanted to do was be a pastor. That's great. So tell us what's the best part of seminary been for you and what's been the most challenging aspect? Yeah, um, I, I think it has to be um, just the connections that I got to make. Um, if any of you all know anything about Karen, it's, um, it's a largely reformed school, evangelical, but um, the guys in my program come from all different kind of church backgrounds. So um, I was one of the few Presbyterians uh, at Karen, but a lot of kind of uh, reformed Baptist types. Um, and a lot of guys that come out of the African American church. And I really just appreciated the time that I got to spend with these guys um, and just building close friendships and hearing about um, kind of their background and their ministries and, and you know, their aspirations for ministry and where God was leading them. And the most Hard challenging. To, what's that? And the most what's challenging. Oh, uh, believe it or not, it wasn't my language classes. Um, <laughs> They were, they were at times a bear, but um, I think what made seminary a little bit difficult was the stage of life that I was in while I was pursuing my MDiv. My first year in seminary, Penny was born, and uh, that being a new parent, a relatively new married couple, um, and throwing a master's degree on top of that had its own challenges. And uh, as you know, uh, about halfway through, Jasper was born, so there's uh, there's another uh, little one on top of all that. Um, and then there's also the, the ministries that I was involved in at Kennett and trying to, um, trying to continue to do those well. Um, and then for much of, much of my master's program, I was still working at the, at the garage. So I, I, think, I think what made it challenging was I never felt like I was fully present really anywhere. I'm extremely blessed to have a wife that handled that really, really well. And uh, was super supportive um, during this time, but that that definitely was the hardest part. Is just feeling feeling constantly distracted or feeling like your attention needed to be somewhere else. That was challenging. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I mean, I think every, everyone at PCKS will say that uh, we were we stood in awe at how you juggled all of that, and I don't think anyone would have ever said that they didn't feel that you were present with them um, in all the ministry you've been doing. So um, praise God for that. I mean, I know it must have felt like a huge struggle on your end, but you, you handled it incredibly well, and we're grateful for Carla too on that. So well, I just I just say to to all of you, um, your your constant support and encouragement throughout this time has just been um, a blessing to me and our family. You guys were always super supportive uh, and always encouraged us and uh, sought to find ways to, to help us and bless us. So we're just, we're very grateful for that. So one last question. So while a few in this, in the congregation will probably end up ever going to seminary, what, what uh, lessons or traits disciplines did you learn there that you would encourage every Christian to try to grow in? Before I started my MDiv, I wasn't, I wasn't much of a reader, but over these last four or so years, I've really, I, I developed a love for reading. Um, and I think part of that is just out of the necessity of it um, and how much, and how much you have to read. But um, so I, I would, I would encourage everyone in that to, um, to not try to focus on, you know, reading a bunch of books, try to, try to read good books, ask, ask Andrew for some recommendations. He'll, you know, I'm sure point you in the right direction. But one thing about reading that I think we get um, confused about is, is we try to burn through books just to check them off the list. And I think the real joy in reading comes from the actual um, activity of reading itself in reading a sentence or a paragraph that just strikes you in a way and you have time to stop and just kind of meditate on what was said and think about it and let it inform your, your thoughts. And I think that's been really valuable for me just as I'm reading, you know, theology or, or really anything to have that time of reflection to just stop and meditate on it for a little bit. And I would encourage everybody to do that, to, to take your time with books and kind of let yourself get lost in them. That's really good. Well, listen, let me, uh, let me pray for you. All right, let's pray. Right. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for Jeremy, uh, for uh, who you've made him to be and who you continue to de be developing in him into. We praise you for his family, for Carla, for Penny, for Jasper. And we praise you particularly for sustaining him, giving him perseverance uh, through his time in at Cairn. We rejoice at him uh, being able to graduate now with his Master of Divinity. We pray that this would be a, a stepping stone and a platform for ministry in which you will bless him and his family richly in the years ahead. We thank you for the privilege it is for us to be partners with him in ministry. And uh, we pray your great blessing on him and his family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is 2 Kings chapter 4, 1-7. to seven. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? And she said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your son and pour it into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God. And he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. And you and your sons can live on the rest. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Mercer, for reading our passage today. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you are the living Lord, the God who speaks, the God who has revealed yourself to us in your word. We are most grateful that as your spirit takes your word, he applies it in our hearts and changes us. So we pray today that no matter what kind of week we've had, what sort of questions we're asking about life and meaning and reality, no matter what point we are at in our journey of faith, you will speak into each of our lives today. We ask this in the name of the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
If you've ever spent any amount of time in the Old Testament, you'll know that there's no shortage of dramatic and miraculous stories there. But with every story, there's a context, there's a reason for the miraculous. And more often than not, it's God's way of moving along the big story of redemption, of how God will provide a savior who one day will come to rescue his people. So God will provide a son to a childless woman, for example, or rescue someone on the brink of death so that the family line of the Savior will continue. Well, today we come to two stories that don't fit that mold. They're just there. They're, they're two stories appropriate for today of two mothers, one an unnamed widow and one an unnamed wealthy woman. And their stories just seem to be here as an encouragement for such a time as we're in, for anyone who will just stop to read or to listen. Because here's what their stories tell us today, that the living God is the help of the helpless and the nameless. And from that, I, I want us all to see that since God is the help of the helpless and the nameless, God is ready to help you too. These two women, helpless and nameless in both of the stories, model faith for us. And so we're going to look at three things about their faith today. The simplicity of faith, the focus of faith, and the wellness of faith. First then, the simplicity of faith. Listen again to the first verse of the passage read for us this morning from 2 Kings 4, uh, verse 1. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. Now, a little context here might be helpful for us. As, as Israel had begun to displace the Lord by turning to pagan gods, one victim of that shift was the nation's social system. The God of Israel cared especially for widows and for the fatherless. He had directed the institution of many laws that protected the vulnerable from falling into irredeemable debt and their children from being sold into slavery. But those safeguards had essentially been thrown out the window by this current administration, the impact of which must have affected many, many people. It certainly had affected this woman. Here was a woman who had lost her husband by death, and now, as if that grief wasn't enough, she's going to lose her sons by insolvency. Her husband had been part of Elisha's ministry team, so she comes to the prophet to explain her, her terrible predicament. And as you read on, Elisha appears eager to help, but he doesn't seem quite sure as to how he can. He asks the widow what she has in the house. All she says she has is a jar of oil. So the prophet instructs her to go around all her neighbors and gather all the empty containers that she can get. She and her sons were then to go inside, close the doors, and start pouring oil into these containers. And so that's what they do. They get as many empty vessels as possible, and they start pouring and pouring and pouring, and the oil keeps flowing and flowing and flowing until all the vessels they had were full. The woman reports this to Elisha, who tells her to sell the oil, pay your debts, and then you and your sons can live on the rest. And that's where this story just ends. So you would ask, why would the narrator have given us this story? Well, it really is just here as a re simple reminder that God loves to take care of his people and he's the God of abundant generosity. He loves to provide for our needs. It's worth noticing to what he specifically responds to here. There, there is a desperation here on the part of the mother, but it's a faith-filled desperation. And that's seen in her coming with her need to Elisha, the servant of the Lord. In other words, her crying out to the prophet was really a crying out to God. Notice that her faith doesn't speculate here. She doesn't tell God what to do. She doesn't even suggest a solution or raise possible options. There's a simplicity to this woman's faith that is content to inform God and cling to God. 
And in that sense, she's like the one who actually was the king in the southern kingdom of Judah at this time, King Jehoshaphat, who, when faced with a desperate situation in his own life, spoke these words to God saying, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. May our eyes of faith be fixed on the living God who always knows what to do and who loves to respond to simple faith. Now then the, then brings us to the longer story of these two in this chapter as the narrator shifts focus from a destitute w- woman to a, a wealthy woman in a village of the, called Shunem. A woman who models for us our second point this morning, the focus of faith. Let's set the scene as we read verses 8 to 13. One day, Elisha went to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived, who urged him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold now, I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair and a lamp so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. One day he came there and he turned into the chamber and rested there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. When he had called her, she stood before him. And he said to him, say now to her, see, you have taken all this trouble for us. What is to be done for you? As you read the stories of Elisha, you, you get the sense he was well liked. People seemed attracted to him. And, and here's such an example. So on his travels, Elisha would often pass through Shunem and this wealthy woman who lived there with her husband would offer Elisha hospitality. That started with sharing meals with him and then they convert a room in their house for the prophet to stay in. Elisha obviously feels much indebted to this woman for her hospitality and so he asks his servant Gehazi to bring her to him and he asks her, you know, given all the trouble you've gone gone to for me, what, what can I do for you? Elisha actually seems a bit at a loss as to what that might be when the only suggestion he can come up with is that he could put in a good word for her to the king or to the commander of the army it seems rather random well the woman replies no no she says i'm fine i've everything that i need right right here in in my own clan and community she leaves and elisha then continues the conversation with gehazi essentially asking his servant i mean what do you get for the woman who apparently has everything Well, Gehazi has an idea. He informs Elisha of two facts. The woman has no son and her husband is old. Now, I'm not sure what it says about Elisha's observation skills or his social awareness that he he needed Gehazi to point those things out to him. Nevertheless, Elisha has Gehazi call her again. And so we read this in verses 15 to 16. He said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway and he said, at this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your servant. Now, before we see how all this transpires, we we need to hit the pause button for a moment. You know what? While Mother's Day is a day of celebration for for many of us, it's also a day of pain for some of us. For for some of you, that's because your mother is no longer here. And today is one of those days when you particularly miss her. But for some of you, this is a painful day because you so long to be a mother and that hasn't happened. The problem of childlessness can be extremely difficult for couples today and often particularly for the wife, whether whether you know this firsthand or have walked with friends or family through that pain, you know it goes to the very very bone and marrow of a want to mother's soul. Well, it may be hard to believe, but childlessness was even more heartbreaking in the time of this Shunammite woman. The ancient Near East, if, if a woman was infertile and unable to have children, she, 
She was considered something of a failure as a woman. You had to have children and family to know that you were significant, to know that you were a, a somebody. A woman with no children would have lived with, with the stigma that, that in her community, she was essentially considered faulty goods, second class because she was barren. Well, as the Shunammite woman hears this promise of a son from Elisha, she basically asks him just to stop. She, she might have cared deeply for this man of God, and she may have longed greatly for a child, but this must have felt somewhat cruel to her. She had already faced all the pain that her condition involved, the, the frustrated hopes, the the looks from neighbors and friends, even the temptation to feel bitterness before God. The, the whole thing must have been a, a long, drawn-out struggle and involving deep self-questioning and perhaps a crisis of faith. But, but the good news was she had won that battle. She'd overcome her doubts about God's goodness and reoriented her life entirely to God's service and, and glory. But now here was this man thoughtlessly, apparently opening up a wound that long ago had been healed by her own self-sacrifice and by the love of God. But nevertheless, despite all of that, Elisha's prophecy comes true. Verse 17, but the woman conceived and she bore a son about that time, the following spring, as Elisha had said to her. So all's well that ends well, right? Not exactly. Here's what follows immediately in the story from verse 18 to 20. When the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. And he said to his father, oh, my head, my head. The father said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And when he had lifted him and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap till noon, and then he died. In the space of three verses, we get a, a mini biography of this boy. It begins with, with the child growing, and it ends with he died. An, an abrupt biography, to say the least. And the brevity of the account just underlines the brutal tragedy and confusion of, of losing this miracle child. The mother's anguish could only have been exacerbated by the boy still being alive when he's brought to her and then literally dying in her lap. It's a shocking turn of events. When, when Elisha had asked the woman back in verse 13 if he could do anything for her, she literally couldn't come up with anything. She had no needs. Well, now she needs something. Now she's very needy. And the seemingly cruel irony is that it was God's gift of a miracle son that had now died, that had made her needy. God had given a gift only now to take it away. Well, all of a sudden here, there's a flurry of activity in the story. But what we want to notice in the midst of the action is this woman's focus of faith. She takes her dead son to Elisha's room. She lays him on Elisha's bed and shuts the door, tells her husband, who obviously doesn't know their son is dead at this point, to, to get one of their servants and a donkey so she can go visit Elisha. And off she goes on the 15-mile journey to Mount Carmel, urging her servant to get her there as fast as possible. When she gets to Elisha, she falls to the ground. She grabs his feet and she exclaims, didn't I tell you not to deceive me? Did I ask you for a son? Elisha then sends Gehazi without delay to the boy with his staff to lay it on his face to see if that would raise him. Gehazi goes and tries that. Nothing happens and returns with the news that it didn't work. We're going to see in a moment how God does bring this woman's son back to life. But before we get there, it's worth noticing in the story whose faith is directed in the right place. Just in case we need some help on this, listen to this verse from the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 11, a chapter that highlights the faith of many of the saints in the Old Testament. Listen to verse 35 in that chapter. We read this, by faith, Women received back their dead, raised to life again. 
Without a doubt, the writer here was thinking of at least the Shunammite woman as one of those women of faith. Just think about what's going on here in 2 Kings 4 for a moment. And, and who has any idea about what is going on? The boy's father doesn't, since he's not even aware his son is dead. Gehazi doesn't. When the, the woman's approaching, he meets her, and, and the conversation goes something like this. <clears throat> is there something I can help you with? I'm the personal assistant of the man of God. What is this concerning? She says, I just want to see the man of God. Gehazi <clears throat> clears his throat. Let me repeat myself. I'm the personal executive assistant of the man of God. What's the problem? You're the problem. I need to see the man of God. But then even with the man of God, with Elisha, he doesn't know what to do either. His first reaction is, well, time's of the essence here. So he immediately sends Gehazi ahead. Turns out time wasn't really critical at all. And when he sends Gehazi, he sends him with his staff. Why? You figure, well, Moses' staff worked miracles. Maybe mine will too. Well, guess what? The staff didn't work. Just incidentally, sidebar here, the only way you can explain this story is, is that it actually happened. Some, some scholars want us to believe that the Elisha story is kind of like the, the Gospels, that they're legends, they're not historical narratives, that they want to suggest that Elisha's followers later embellished stories about him to increase his fame, the fame of this prophet. All I can say to that is that if that was the case, they, they really did a lousy job here. Because the last thing you, you do if you want to enhance a prophet's fame is to depict him as shrugging his shoulders as if to say, beats me, and then trying some ideas that don't work. Now this story has the ring of, the, of truth written all over it. Now, the only person who seems to actually get what's going on here is the woman. She's not going to go with Gehazi and the staff. She tells Elisha, I'm, I'm sticking with you. And that's not because she thinks he understands what's going on. It's because he's the man of God. He's God, God's anointed prophet. Her sticking with Elisha is her sticking with God. The focus of her faith is on the Lord. Her only hope is the living God. Just as our only ultimate hope is the living God. The model of trust in this passage for us is none other than the Shunammite woman. Which brings us then finally to the wellness of faith. So this mother had faith, but, but still you wonder, what made this woman think that she can get an exemption from something that comes to everyone? Well, we've had to face the reality of death during this pandemic in a way that most of us never have had to probably before. The, the truth is that throughout all of history, people have struggled with death and how to understand death. Well, it turns out that the Bible has an extremely coherent explanation of death. It, it starts with the premise that if you put someone in charge of something and they're not competent, it falls apart. You put a seven-year-old in a cockpit of an airplane, it's not going to be long before that plane will end up in pieces. Put an incompetent person in charge of a business, that business will be in pieces. The Bible challenges us to see that we have sought to be in charge of our own lives. We, we want to call the shots. We want to be the masters of our lives and of the world, but what we fail to see is that we are incompetent to do that. We weren't created to do that so that everything as a result in this life ends up falling apart and in the end dying. As startling as the COVID-19 mortality statistics may be, the, the reality is that death is a sentence that will come eventually to all of us because of the way all of us have treated one another and because of the way we've treated God. As the Apostle Paul puts it in the New Testament, the wages of sin is death. Yet here this woman has the audacity to say, I want an exemption. Bob Dylan sang in one of his songs, the disease of conceit gives you the idea that you're too good to die. Well, was it a case here with this mother trying to suggest that she or her boy was just too good to die? Well, it turns out that this mother's request was not out of line 
as is demonstrated in the final scene. Listen to verses 32 to 35. When Elijah came into the house, he saw the child lying on his bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. During this pandemic, we've all kind of become accustomed to an extra wariness when we see or hear someone sneeze. It's it's not been a sound that for us is the bearing of good news, at least before we were all wearing masks. But that's certainly not the case here. Just as, as his mentor Elijah had done with another dead boy, Elisha stretches out over this son, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, palms to palms, essentially crying out to God, may this lifeless body be as my living body. And the boy's body becomes warm. Elisha gets up and he walks around. He stretches himself out again. And God hears Elisha's prayer. And the boy's nose recovers before his eyes do. Sneezes never sounded so healthy because God had restored the boy to life. As his mother had said all through this ordeal, all is well. Those words of the woman are picked up in the hymn we'll be singing at the end of our service today. It's a hymn which was written by a man called Horatio Spafford. Spafford was a lawyer in Chicago, a committed Christian. He lost much of his fortune in the Chicago fire of 1871, but that loss was but a drop in the ocean compared to the loss he would suffer two years later. Because in the autumn of 1873, Spafford sent his wife, Anna, and four daughters ahead of him for a holiday in England. In mid-ocean, the steamship carrying his family members collided with another ship, and within 12 minutes it had sunk. 230 people lost their lives that day. The four daughters were drowned, but Mrs. Spafford was found floating unconscious by a rescue ship, and she survived. She would wire her husband the message, saved alone. And when Spafford was on the ship over to England to bring his wife home, feeling, I'm sure, utterly helpless, he began to write this hymn. It is well with my soul. Now here's the question. How could a man who didn't receive the miracle received by the Shunammite woman, who lost all four of his daughters, how could he say it is well with my soul? Well, the second verse specifically tells us how. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Spafford's wellness of faith came from knowing the greater Elisha. As we saw last week, Elisha's name means God saves in that he was pointing forward to the one whose name meant the Lord the Lord saves, namely Jesus. When God had looked down from heaven on Elisha's bedroom that day, he couldn't see that, that boy. He could only see Elisha because Elisha identified with the boy. He filled the exact space of the boy so that when God looked down, the boy was hidden in him. But you see, what Elisha did symbolically, Jesus did in reality. As Jesus hung on the cross, it was as if he was covering us mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, palms to palms, so that when God's wrath comes, came down upon us, who did it actually fall upon? It fell upon Jesus. Jesus stretched himself out on us so that the judgment of God on our sin couldn't touch us. So if Horatio Spafford had wondered, maybe I'm being punished here, he could look at the cross and say, no, no, all the punishment has fallen on Jesus. And if he'd wondered, maybe God doesn't care about me anymore, he could look at the cross and say, but no, look what he has done for me through Jesus. Because you see, the Bible presents to us the God who says, I lost a child too, but not involuntarily, but voluntarily for your sake. 
so that it might be ultimately well for you. Since God is the help of the helpless and even here of the nameless, be assured that God is ready to help you too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is a sign of your grace that you would give us stories like these that don't necessarily move the plot line along in your story of redemption, your story of rescue, but they're just given to us as a reminder of your care for us, your love for us, your generosity and abundance with us. And that ultimately you are the God of resurrection life. You are the God of the helpless and the nameless. You are the God who is committed to all who might put their trust and their faith in you as these two women did. We praise you for their example. We pray that we would heed their example and exercise that same faith in you. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We actually have two people in the congregation receiving their master's degrees this month. One is Jeremy and the other one happens to be Tara, my wife, who next weekend will graduate with her MFA, her Master's in Fine Arts in Creative Writing. She's also our Director of Children's Ministry and she's going to now lead us in our prayer of intercession. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your love and faithfulness and we praise you because you're holy and merciful, tender and righteous, omnipotent, and receptive to our heart's cries. We come to you on Mother's Day with many different emotions. Some of us are filled with deep gratitude and joy for the mothers you have blessed us with, mothers who have loved us, cared for us, walked with us, and taught us how to live well. We praise you for the love you've shown to us through our mothers, and we pray for all those who are mothers, that you would give them strength where they are weak, wisdom where they are unsure, patience with the many demands placed upon them, faith in your care for them and their families, and deep love for those whom you have given them to nurture. For others, Mother's Day brings sadness and pain. Many of us miss our mothers, a grief that endures, and some of us grieve because our relationship with our mother is not easy or was not easy or perhaps never existed at all. Many of us who are mothers long for our children to know and follow you. Father, please meet us in our pain. Heal our hearts where they are wounded. Soften our hearts where they are hardened. And enable us to forgive and to love even those who have hurt us. Others of us are saddened because we long to be mothers. Father of mercies, give us comfort in our sadness trust in you despite unfulfilled longings, and joy in knowing that you never stop loving us or having our best in mind. We lift up Murphy to you, one of the vibrant and beautiful mothers in our church family. We pray for strength and continued healing for her, and for wisdom for her doctors, and continued grace for Chris and all of her family caring for her and for Luke in Ireland. We also pray for our community, for our small business owners and their employees, for the mushroom industry, for those who have lost jobs and homes because of COVID-19. And we pray for all of the people and organizations working tirelessly to care for those in our community who have desperate needs right now. We pray for comfort, for strength, for wisdom to know how we can help. And we pray for the children in our church family and in our community, for protection for them, for comfort that that will bridge the gap between our understanding and the scope of what's happening in our world right now. We pray for their parents and their teachers, for wisdom, patience, and humor as they keep on keeping on through these difficult weeks and months. Heavenly Father, help us this week to be mindful of one another, to tend and encourage the stories of those around us through prayer and friendship, thoughtfulness and conversation, 
affirming and amplifying one another's good works, reaching out across the divisions this pandemic has brought with a goal of building up your body so that your kingdom would be more fully realized in this world and in this time. We know it's by your will and through your grace that we are here now to grow in our love for you and glorify you in darker days than many of us have yet known. We pray these things to you as our Father, who loved us before the world began and will love us forevermore. Help us, we pray, to keep our eyes and hearts fixed on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a quick thank you to everyone who's continued to give so faithfully to the ministry of the Presbyterian Church of Kennett Square during these difficult times. I'd just like to say thank you for your faithfulness. And just to remind everyone that if you wish to give to the ministry of this church, both to the local gospel ministry in Kennett Square and abroad to the work of our missionaries, you can do so by clicking the link just below this video. There's a link to Planning Center where you can give online or if you'd rather, you can mail an offering directly to the church office. But at this time, I invite you to stand as we sing our final song, When Peace Like a River. Thank you so much for joining us this morning in our service. We really are most grateful that you would have chosen to spend some of your Sunday morning with us today. Quick reminder that if you'd like to come by and say hello, if you're new to our community, you'll find our Zoom chat room details in the description box underneath the video. We really would love to uh, meet you. If you have questions about our church or the, anything you've watched in our service today, it'd be a great place to ask those questions or just to say hello. But as we close now, hear this blessing from God upon us. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. 
And may the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you for his service. And may the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.